first at 6.33. I think we have most people present. I um, want to add a couple items to the agenda. Uh, equity committee update. And then also, we neglected to approve the HHB policy monitoring report at the retreat that got lost in the shuffle to get food. So we can add that. Let's slot that in with the other policy monitoring report. Um, under policy monitoring. Uh, before I start, I also just want to give a quick shout out to uh, all the teachers and administrators who put on the MHS open house. Um, I thought it was fantastic. Um, and I also just know the, the teachers did kind of a seven minute slots of, of classroom speed dating on, on what they were doing in their class. So I'm sure it was a a long night for them, but it was super informative and great to, to get back <coughs> to the classroom and see what, what the kids are doing, what they're learning. So, um, and I'm sure the other schools will also do something similar, but I just wanted to acknowledge all the great work and extra time put into that. Um, public comment, no one? Anyone online? Just wanted to have yep, they do. <laughs> Is that like a keyboard or? <laughs> So it looks like no one online either. Uh, consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, so board discussion and possible action. Uh, so just finance committee update. I know they got a briefing on the um, fourth quarter report, uh, which I have to admit I did not look at because I accidentally erased. Um, I accidentally erased the email. Uh, but any reports from the finance committee? Um, we received, we just held our meeting just before this meeting started of our finance subcommittee. Um, our business manager, Christina Kimball, walked us through um, the fourth quarter budget, FY22 fourth quarter um, report. Um, and then there's a really nice little summary of some of the highlights for some of the bigger funds and our long term debt. Um, she received a lot of questions beforehand from Anna Kit and, and Mia. We went through those, but um, I think I think you wanted to maybe ask some of those at the meeting. So I think we're prepared to take any questions. Great. Yeah, Mia, you want to just ask your questions? Yeah. yeah, great. So the first question I have is there's about three million plus that we spend on special education. Is all of that reflected on the revenue side in all those different buckets um, that are outside of ed spending in gen general education on the revenue side? Do you want me to answer this question? What do you think, Joe? Oh. Uh. <laughs> yes, was the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I thought so. I just was having a hard time lining those up. Um, and then at the bottom of revenue, where it says fund balance transfer, it looks like we did not, at the end of FY22, transfer the 400000 we thought we were going to need to. Does that mean that if you scroll down further in the assigned... I see you nodding, Jill. That, yeah. I'm going to finish my question so that everybody yeah, can yeah. hear it. But um, that in the assigned, there's $800,000... Um, assigned for FY 22 and 23, half of that essentially wasn't used in FY 22? Right. So on the um, fund balance information, essentially that would put that $400,000 back in there. Or no, that's included in the 800000 Is that right? That's how I read it. So yeah. the 800 will turn into 400000 Or we'll add Right, we'll add four hundred. We'll add four hundred thousand to that. We're not using it. Right, yeah. so there's still four hundred thousand dollars in the fund balance that we thought would be there, Correct. and it is still there. Okay. Um, what's the outside placement settlement? Um, that's a multi-year confidential um, 
settlement about an outside placement for a student that the district is paying back. It Got sounds it. like this might be the last payment. Got it. And then on the buildings and Sorry, oh. settlement of it's a confidential matter around special education. Okay. Um on the buildings and grounds line of expenditures in the notes section, it lists the tractor, ventilation, tent rentals, HEPA filters. So it looks like that, that to me it says that we bought those things last year, but then it also looks like they might be listed under um, anticipated expenses for under the fund balance narrative. So I just wanted to see, did we, I might be reading it wrong as well. No, I think that's a good question. I think we determined that those have been purchased already. Okay. Do the, <laughs> we can take them off the list. Okay. Great. And then that small schools grant, is that because Roxbury is a tiny school or are any of our other schools also small schools? And it's, it's only just, just, Roxbury. Rock, just, just Roxbury. Roxbury? Okay. It's a combination of population and distance from other schools, I think. I mean, broadly speaking. Got it. And then there's, I appreciated having that food service section in the narrative. I am curious about, and as I mentioned in my email, I think this is maybe a bigger conversation that the board should have, but um, why we call it an enterprise service rather than it just being a part of what it takes to run a school. I don't know if you have a one minute answer to that, Christina, or if that's just something that we should have for a bigger conversation. self-sustaining entity it needs to be in its own fund whether or not you keep your employees in that fund or not is is something that we could discuss mm -hmm. um, because salary and benefits that keep rising and that's why that program doesn't sustain itself sure so that, that is a bigger conversation about how we how we're running that program right but it does need to maintain its stay in its own fund you can't use the, those federal dollars for anything but food service sure all the reimbursements and revenues that we're getting to stay separate. Right. And the any reimbursements and revenues could, if we keep staff salaries and benefits housed there, those those reimbursements can go toward those staff salaries. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And so it's mostly an accounting designation, it being is. calling it an enterprise service. Yeah. Because we take in money from well we used to anyway, by having like families pay. Well it's a, it's an accounting standard. Okay. the program separate from your general fund. Got it. Okay. I still don't fully, fully understand that, but I oh. think it's, that's good for now. <laughs> that's good for now. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. No, and we, we talked about that a little bit more because there's also, you know, there was the universal free meals program that it sounds like the state used state, um, ARPA or ESSER or whatever the acronym mm -hmm. is, funds for. So this year it was... There was no like free reduced lunch. It was it was universal free meals. Everybody, yeah. And so theoretically, that is something that was a success, and the state will sort of put into place. But the funding for that is not coming from the state. So that's basically like a and Libby could say this better than I. But like that's something very much we will need to spend some time on sort of the philosophical and budgeting of this because we will not be able to charge for these, but we are going to be required to provide them. Yeah. Without that state help that schools got this year. So far the right? legislation hasn't gone through. So the legislature just okay. voted for this school year. Okay. Um, however, keep in mind that the legislature comes back in session after our budget is already passed. So So just so I explain, are they are they giving us an unfunded mandate to provide most likely free lunch? That was what the conversation was last year. Um, they came through with ESSER money from the state. But that's going away. But we don't have that anymore. We spent yeah. it. So, um, so yeah. So last year when we said, or when people were saying, why are we just doing this for a year? Figure out a long-term solution, legislature. Their solution to it at that time would be an unfunded mandate. Would be to keep that has never gone. Into, that forward. didn't go into law though. Okay. Um, so we. So who knows what they'll decide to do this year? Yeah. I I have a question. So right now everything in this is free, in the, for the food or food nutrition. Yeah. Okay. So if it does pass in November, is it, is that when they will take it up? No, 
No. 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 It's usually usually it comes into year, session in yeah. January. January. Yeah. And it's, they don't usually pass things on the first day. No. <laughs> right. It's usually it's a mad a rush the last, <laughs> what, two weeks a month? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so we could be stuck basically paying for this for some time until the money becomes available, if it becomes available. Or it could just be something we need to figure out pass internally. Pass on yeah. Got it. It's a hard, and it's a really hard yep. piece because nobody wants to deny kids food, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, um, with the there are lots of monsoons coming at our particular district mm -hmm. because of um, 127, the waiting study, which was also a good law, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's lots of good intention and good laws. It's just the question of who pays for it mm -hmm. is a is a fairly large and important mm -hmm. question to answer. Mm -hmm. Those were all of my questions. So other, thank you. Other Jill questions and for the finance committee? Maybe just an observation that yeah. our target of having two and a half percent sort of left over as a rainy day fund is about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars and the likely cost of not being reimbursed for free food is more like a million, maybe somewhere. somewhere between. I try. I searched for it briefly, but um, it's somewhere between six hundred thousand and a million for a year. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, which is not insignificant. No. no. Somewhere in between think, is a lot, though. <laughs> I know. I just can't. Grant did the math. Like uh -huh. did the back of the napkin math yeah. from two years ago. So it's risen since mm -hmm. then. Um, and I just can't pull the number out of my head right now. And I searched for old emails okay. and I can't find it. Um, but <coughs> Christina would have to do that calculation all over again anyway, because it would be different now because the food costs have risen, bent sellers and benefits have risen, you know, like lots of things have risen since Grant did that back in the napkin map. My hunch is it's closer to $600,000. That's what my hunch is, is I think through it more. Um, I remember talking about it with legislatures and saying something along the lines of that's the equivalent of about four to five teachers. You know, trying to put it into perspective for legislatures is what that means. Um, so I can remember that kind of number, which was is less than $600,000, however, may not be less for much longer. If the, the food quality or like Change, did it change from when parents were paying to when this became universal lunch, or did it keep steady, kind of like the same food? The same types of food? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's most definitely the same types of food. In fact, our last year, I don't know what the numbers are this year yet. I haven't checked in on that. But last year, we gave out a significantly more amount of lunch um, than we have this year, or than we had in past years. Now last year everything was free and it was and it was different accounting for who took what. So this year you all if you're a parent in our district, you've gotten stuff of the plate is free, like the the meal that we're required with the required nutritional components is the free part. If a kid at the high school says says goes in and gets uh, ice cream, I don't know, <laughs> you know, something extra that's not part of the a actual cart. meal. Yeah, a la carte, thank you. Um, that needs to be paid for because mm -hmm. that's not part of the universal part. Okay. And that's really only an option, I think, at the high school, maybe at the middle school. I don't think there's much a la carte at the elementary schools. Like, like chocolate milk. The only thing that could be yeah. Yeah. So my unprofessional just reflection on what we're learning and what we're doing is we've had these great opportunities with these various COVID funds and lots of grant opportunities. And so we're in really good shape in a lot of ways. And we know there's, as Libby's been saying, like there's these sort of things coming on the pike, like the food service is a big thing. The waiting study is a big thing. So as long as we're really sort of smart and strategic and careful and, and like, proactive to sort of get through this, then I, it certainly seems like in my unprofessional opinion that as a district we're in good shape because we do have this fund balance and we were able to pay for things out of the grant but it doesn't just mean that that will always be there so it's just there's going to be i think there's going to be a lot of changing components as the grants go away 
and other factors change. And we learn more information about those other factors. There's a lot of question marks in right. the air. Um, I move to approve the fourth quarter financial report. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. Um, and good to hear from Jess again on restorative practices. Thank you for giving us two evenings of your time this week. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for welcoming me. Um, so I think everyone probably has this up. Has everyone read it? Yeah, I shared the report for everybody. So it should be in your email and I will share my screen hopefully right now. I'm having trouble sharing my screen earlier. So I might have to have Anna. Hey, Anna, my dear, can you share the screen for me? I have to figure out how to do that with my computer. And a computer. Yes, can you email me that report real quick? Christina, can you, are you on it? Oh, you just got off, didn't you? Would it help if I joined Zoom? Is that, yeah, is anybody else on Zoom? No, but I can, I can join. Sorry, but I tried to do this the other day with something two minutes and it work on my computer. I have to ask my tech guys how to do that. Oh, wait, Anna's got it. it. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Anna. All right, go for it, Jess. All right, so um, I'm excited to talk about sort of practices there. A sort of um, something that's really close to my heart and something that I'm really passionate about. So thank you Lindsay, um, for making us part of sort of my role here. Uh, so I think when we often talk about restorative practice, people have a lot of different views and a lot of different lenses around restorative practices and what they mean. So I just wanted to start by giving like a really brief context and some what I think was helpful framing for this presentation. So we know that in the United States, they're really rooted in indigenous practice and then later schools have adopted them as a way to build community and really think more specifically about alternatives for traditional discipline, um, because we know in a lot of ways that's not giving us the outcomes that we want. Um, so when we when I think about restorative practices, I really think about uh, relationships and belonging as being a really central sort of tier one universal first goal. Um, a second one I think is empowerment and how empowerment leads to positive change. And when I'm talking about empowerment, we're really thinking primarily about students. Um, and also I hope to get to faculty as well and sort of have both students and faculty feel empowered to create changes in our school district. Um, and then the third major tenant or guiding practices that I see is conflict resolution is restorative and reparative. So as I think, sorry, I changed slides here. So I'm on the umbrella side at this point. Um, so when I was thinking about restorative sort of practices and again, how to frame this for folks, I really take more of an inclusive lens of restorative sort of practices. There's certainly sort of a tiered version of restorative sort of practices and what is, there's really specific practices and circle mediations. Um, but when I was thinking about my work and how to frame this and how it comes up in Montpelier or Roxbury, it's really embedded in a lot of different ways. So I see all of these things as under the bigger umbrella of restorative practices, right? When we talk about community building or wellness or sense of belongings, without those things, we can't do restorative practices. So I feel like it's really sort of a connected relationship. So some of our current goals, again, sorry, I'm on slide three at this point. Um, when we think about current goals, again, I really separate it in three chunks. The first being this building a universal sense of belonging and community wellness and really understanding one another, building a sense of community so that we can understand how to compassionately respond to one another. A second one I see is a growing sense of self-agency and a sense of empowerment and voice for folks in our community and building the skills needed for students to be able to create positive changes in their schools. 
and being really authentic partners in our school systems. And then third um, is really thinking about how we repair harm when it's done in our community. Onward. So when I think about uh, faculty and restorative practices, right now our focus has really intentionally been wellness. Libby has made it a really intentional focus for us this year in a way that I think is really crucial, particularly coming out of the last few years with COVID and isolation and not having the same opportunities to build our wellness when we know that people were stretched pretty thin. So there is regular use of circles. This was a part of the in-service in many of our buildings, uh, teacher to teacher, adult adult circles to help build connections, really connect with one another, expand knowledge of restorative practice and really gain some comfort in being a part of circles and running circles themselves. Um, we have time built in uh, with our schedules intentionally to set aside for teacher and adult wellness in our buildings. Um, for example, we have Wednesday wellness with the high school and then on Mondays there is half an hour built in during staff meetings for UES uh, teachers to sort of do what they need to be well. Additionally, Libby has set forth some wonderful work norms for us in the district around email practices and making sure that we are specifically taking time to connect with our families and, you know, be humans outside of our jobs. And we did a lot of work intentionally set setting wellness goals individual, as individuals in our um, in-service time as well. And then we're continuing the work. This is one thing that is on my plate and I'm really excited about is really collectively framing community wellness for our district and what that looks like so we can build a vision around what community wellness is. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about professional development opportunities later. So I'm gonna dive into the elementary schools here. What I did, I sort of took a page out of Libby's book that you saw on Monday and sort of crowdsourced some of their sort of practices. So I sent an email out to some of the folks that do this work in our district and also the administrators to get sort of firsthand knowledge from them around what has been happening in our schools and what some of the positive repercussions or consequences, I guess those aren't the right words, but the effects of restorative practices. So again, with that framing of belonging, um, our UES and RBS are really being very intentional about setting the stage for belonging, making sure that they're helping students feel safe and a sense of community um, as part of the first few weeks to make sure kids have really strong sense of belonging and connections um, with the idea that that will proactively minimize some conflicts. And then empowerment, really teaching kids how to use I statements and advocate for themselves and empowering them to ask for change. I'm really excited about this. We're partnering with Up For Learning to create, and we've already started to think about the end of the year and really be intentional around how we support UES students and RBS students coming together, get to know each other proactively so that when they go to the middle school, they know what restorative practices are, they've seen each other, they've started to get to know one another. Um, and we're hoping to get UES, some UES students here and RBS students um, over to Montpelier before the end of the year so they have some common experiences. Can I add that to the leadership student groups that have been happening at the middle school and the high school are now also happening in our elementary schools for the first year around with up for learning. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I'm excited about that too. Um, and then restorative resolutions. Uh, it's been really wonderful to see some of the work that our administrators and teachers have been doing with students around connecting and repairing harm and really using relationships with one another to be able to communicate um, when we feel impacted and how we move past that as a community. And then moving to some of our older students at the middle school and MHS. Um, and the MSMS uses tier one circles regularly. Every student is doing at least one circle a week. Um, and throughout the year, you know, they start as pretty light. What's your favorite dessert? What's your favorite thing to do during the summertime? And then progressively build up to get a little bit more intentional, a little bit more vulnerable um, as students really solidify that sense of community. 
And then MHS has a pretty strong student-adult partnership. Um, and in the words of a counselor, their overarching goal is aimed at community building and strengthening culture. And if we think about empowerment, some of the groups, this is a lot of the work that the groups at um, the middle school and the high school are doing with Up for Learning. So, you know, hopefully you've seen them present to your board. I was told that that has happened. So I was not there for that, but hopefully that's happening. Um, they're facilitating a lot of our PD this year, which I'm really excited about. Uh, they're really thinking about how to increase social connections, particularly for new students. They're training one another. They're using train the trainer models to help really embed circles as part of our um, culture. And then they're starting to make some pre-made circle scripts for one another. Um, and one of the things that I was really excited about to see particularly at the middle school is they were intentionally using circles and really thinking about during in-service teachers were using circles to think about behavioral scenarios and how to respond and how to build community and how to respond to behavior in a really restorative and reparative way and thinking outside sort of the traditional responses that we often see. Um, and then we're using student students, student adults um, to really think about how to use circles to communicate and repair harm. Yes, a clarifying question. Yeah. Just the facilitation of professional development, is that students are facilitating that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they are, um, at this point, helping to create and facilitate, which is really exciting. Um, so we go to the next slide, actually. Thank you, that is a great transition. That was happening last year, too. Oh, okay. Second year, that. Yeah, so um, John Kidda is really going to be working with us this year. He's going to be working with me specifically on how to develop a district-wide implementation plan for restorative practices, and he's supporting the Up for Learning groups in creating professional development for our four early release days. So John Kidda and Up for Learning are working collaboratively to essentially create our early release days for the high school and the middle school, and they'll be facilitating those. Um, and that is really focused on how do we create a really strong community and communication feedback loop between students and adults so that we can really leverage student voice in order to move us forward and create positive changes. Um, John Kidda is certainly an expert in the field. I'm really excited about working really closely with him. If you don't know him, he is the type of person that, because I've been in their sort of practice work for a while, um, I like saw his name and Libby told me that I was going to be working with him. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's like famous. So, <laughs> you know, I'm just certainly an expert in the field for whatever um, that information gives you. But Out for Learning is also there has been a long history of really thinking about how to leverage student voice, being really intentional about the students that we're inviting to share their voice. Um, I really appreciate that about them. And then Joel Van Lent is also sort of a legend, for me at least as well, um, is a child psychologist and has a really strong trauma-informed lens. And I really appreciate that she's sort of bringing together in really explicit ways to the trauma-informed lens and our sort of practices and what that looks like in our district. Um, so just some guiding questions if you click next. Um, I have a lot of animation in here. Uh, so the work ahead is really framed around how do communication systems foster wellness um, for individuals and communities. That's sort of gonna be our guiding question for the middle school and the high school moving forward for the, um, the PD day is coming up that I'm leading. And then for the elementary schools, because they are just getting into really implementing our sort of practices, we're starting with the question of what strategies, what are some strategies to support the wellness of ourselves and our students? Um, and if you click one more time, I just wanted to leave you with this nice quote that I actually got today from a middle school teacher, just being really excited to see <clears throat> an increase in RP use and circle use. And um, she's feeling like teachers are really seeing the impact of them in our district. So just wanted to leave you with that. Great. Thanks, Joyce. Great. Yeah, thanks, thanks Joyce. Very much. I have a question. Yeah. Um, how are, uh, 
all with all the experts that you're bringing in and like how, what is the intention around racial justice around the trauma informed and really merging and how are BIPOC students being involved and students from the LGBTQ community being involved in the circles themselves and what is their racial justice conversation in those circles? Yeah, so I haven't quite had a chance to really dive into those circles with students. I've been to one meeting so far because that's been my availability. Um, I know that the Up for Learning, as I said, is really intentional about thinking about what are the students we're inviting in. So it's not just one particular demographic. Um, you know, that's certainly a worry that I've seen play out time and time again is when we ask for student voice, it's a really particular type of student. Um, and so I appreciate how intentional they're being. Um, I don't know, Libby, if you want to talk a little more historically about racial justice and what it looks like in our district or... I don't think I could articulately right now talk about the connection between restorative practices and racial justice work. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that is a big problem that we see in a lot of other schools that there is sort of justice practices when it comes to racial justice, racial bullying is not really being implemented the right way. And that's, you know, a lot of the conversations like sometimes we sort of justice when it comes to racial justice, there's a big this happening. So that's something just to consider that I would love for us to consider as an intention of this work that it needs to be included um, because we see a lot of damage and we see a lot of trauma that is happening from a sort of circles when it comes to BIPOC students. And there's a lot of anecdotes, not from this district, but I'm just sharing that experience that I think when we're doing this work, we really have to be intentional around how we bring those voices into the circles and to the conversation, into the trauma-informed so yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. And I'll certainly put that on the forefront when I work with John Fida and the Thriller thing. Thank you. Good questions. <clears throat> like data about things that are actually in absence because they've been resolved is really hard to measure, but like I've always been sort of a friendly skeptic to restorative practices. Like I sort of need, to, I, I, the more I learn, the more it, it makes sense, but it, I, it feels like it could be done incorrectly really easily. So how do you look at data after a while or look at, I don't know, student outcomes after a while and see that that's making a difference? Like what are some things that staff or you would see that would show that it's having a positive impact? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really a good question. Um, I know right now for me, it's been a lot of anecdotal evidence. For example, I had a teacher come up to me today, a different teacher than the one who talked to me or sent me this, just being really thankful for a sort of circle. And it was between two students. Um, and at the surface level, the conflict was about something that happened this year. And then when they were brought together, of course, with a lot of adult guidance and a lot of adult coaching, um, it turned out that it was actually something that had happened last year and they were able to really process and digest that and think about next steps. Um, with our current data that we talked a little bit about on Monday, right? I'm hoping that as we collect more and more of that data, we'll be able to have like less anecdotal data and more, let's think about what are the long-term impacts of restorative practices on behavior that we're seeing day-to-day -day on hopefully preventing HHB stuff. Um, but a lot <laughs> of that stuff, you know, we're, we're new at taking that data, at least from my perspective. And again, I don't have the historical context um, because I'm new, but. I think there's a difference between believing that restorative practices is the answer to every disciplinary action, which it's not, um, and, the idea that just started with around building wellness and community. So I will argue till cows come home that over the pandemic, kids didn't learn much or didn't lose much learning. They lost community. And so did we as adults, right? And that that's having the most significant impact on our kids right now is this, this figuring out how to be together in a community again. And the adults, quite honestly. <laughs> um, so that's the piece that um, that I buy into hook, line, and sinker, sink because it's it's teaching 
everyone how to talk, how to have hard conversations, how to talk to each other, how to have easy conversations when you're talking about your favorite ice cream, you know, um, how to how to be in a group and how to converse in that way, and that's like that um, that Maslow's number one, you know, security, safety, belonging thing is knowing how to talk to each other. You're not going to feel like you belong if you can't if you don't have a voice, right? So. Um, that's the piece that I really enjoy about restorative practices, the community, the wellness, the, the inviting people to belong, teaching people how to have hard conversations, facilitating hard conversations, teaching our adults how to facilitate hard conversations, which is a skill. Um, and we've seen, slowly but surely, we've seen some really what could be heady conversations be had successfully because of this premise. And we still have some explosive behaviors that restorative practices is not going to help, mm -hmm. right? So it's not, it's not the answer for everything. Thank <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I'm really happy you've joined us in this district. It feels like this kind of work is um, just, you know, bouncing off of what Libby just said. I mean, it really is essential. Like, it's not added fluff. This is really necessary given where where kids are at. Um, I'm really grateful to hear that there's going to be some intentional connective work between UES and RBS students. Um, an email from Amandite asking us to kind of pull together community budget priorities that we heard from folks last year. Something that we heard from folks was, uh, you know, we'd really love for our RBS and UES kids to connect with each other and not be like, you know, complete strangers with each other on the first day of school in fifth grade, um, which is a point in life where nobody feels like they belong. <laughs> Everybody feels awkward. So to give them some of those, you know, more meaningful experiences so that they can, um, you know, so families, you know, I know Rhett has been really eager to try to get folks together on playgrounds and connecting that way. Like, you know, it's the district work and it's also the community work. And hopefully when these things come together, you know, we have some kids that are really have relationships come in fifth grade. But I know from the Roxbury perspective, folks are really eager. So I'm really excited to hear that the school is taking that on. Um, in that time that we were getting community input, we also heard from folks that at the middle school level that there were some kids that were having a really hard landing um, at MSMS from Roxbury and that, which was kind of anticipated, right? I mean, I think the merger at some point was called like the odd couple, like a tale of two cities kind of coming together, folks from really different roots and beginnings and, and kind of cultures. And so I heard that there was definitely some hard landings. And I know I think, you know, and Jim, you were there, the original merger was sort of like, we know that we need to be intentional about this middle school kind of coming together. So I'm just excited and it gives me great hope um, for our kids out here in Roxbury that they can just feel if, you know, right, the tier one piece is the community, it's the belonging piece, that they're going to have a stronger foundation. We recently heard about a student's experience of some pretty intense microaggressions about Roxbury, including um, is there water in Roxbury? Where even is Roxbury? Um, can you show me a picture of your house? And then the kids surprised that like they had a nice house, you know? So we know our kids are experiencing some of the, and honestly, when I heard that was really painful and really heartbreaking, that that was like the perception of our community, knowing that like we come from a really great place. This is a really great town and I will happily give you like the grand tour one day if you ever want to come out. Um, but I think that piece in terms of like, the merger and the success of the merger and Emma said the other night just about like right like we're still landing and hopefully in five years our communities have settled in and there's more ease and more connection so I'm hoping you know and it sounds like some of the work that you're doing is really going to help with that landing because we are still sort of mid-air it feels like coming into the merger mm -hmm. so and kind of following up on that I mean one thing that happened very intentionally particularly the first year uh, was the then principal of MSMS really kind of went to big lengths to reach out to the, you know, the families and students that were coming into MSMS. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that evaporated during COVID. Both remember, our first year was the year before COVID. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah both with COVID coming in and then also, um, you know, we had some some principal turnover with, um, you know, an interim principal for a while, and then, you know, Katie's now at UES, so, so I'm just wondering if that work has been forgotten a little, because um, I, I think that was helpful that first year, and 
I think there was probably a perception that things would take care of themselves, but I think with COVID they haven't. And mm -hmm. I also think each, you know, each graduating fourth grader coming into fifth grade at MSMS, mm -hmm. it's as new to them as it, it was to the, you know, the first class that did it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about some of the work that Beth, um, Katie, and I have done. Mm -hmm. um, really, we're trying to think about experiences so that the, a smaller group of UAS students is here and can actually see Roxbury and can see the town and be a part of this community um, so that they have some sense of reference for students who are coming from Roxbury, so mm -hmm. hopefully we can dispel some of those assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're doing some sort of activity or experience at UES, and then we're gonna end at MSMS so that they can meet the principal and see the building and have some sort of like fun, you know, gatory prime <laughs> sort of experience and get excited for middle school. Great, thank you so much. Emma? Um, Thank you for this presentation. It's really great. I mean, we've been hearing about the from the community that they want, you know, stronger restorative practices in the district for a long time. So it's and from teachers and climate survey and stuff like that. So um, so it's great to see like some concrete report on progress. Um, I'm wondering about so the other day you presented to us about the behavior monitoring system that you have in place now with the data collection. I'm just wondering if there's any point on that collection um, apparatus that asks about restorative practices, if they were try attempted, how it went? Yeah, so there is a note for how we responded. So there is a note for how the teacher responded, and there's a section or a column for how like basically it was handled if it gets to administration administrator level as well. Um, so I think that'll be really helpful data as well, and that's something that we really intentionally wanted to see so that we could see sort of what responses were working over time um, as we collect data and what responses maybe we need to reconsider and rethink. Um, and, you know, just from the equity lens, it really helps us see what are responses depending on the student demographic. That's great. And can I uh, also, a thought, th looking at, thinking of bullying harassment and the policy and procedure and the training we just got and thinking, I know, thinking of restorative justice and how microaggressions, you know, all these things intersect. Just thinking about like what the approach is right now. So if there's a bullying harassment case, bullying case, the first, you know, the first case um, that still needs to be, like how are we using restorative justice a rumble in harassment. Yeah, I'm gonna do like the annoying educator response and yeah. say it depends on the situation. Honestly, like Libby said, restorative practices don't fit every situation, right? There are some cases in which that those students are not ready to talk about or it wouldn't be safe to talk about or they don't want to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't do this work without consent from both parties. Um, so it is really case by case dependent, um, and I'm sorry, that's a non-answer. Yeah, no, it's but great. It's a great answer. We try and weave in as much as it can, um, as appropriate. Okay, well, but we still do have the documentation, right? Around like it goes in the both data, the report, the bullying harassment incident report, and the data collection that you're doing around what is happening. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this question about restorative practices, if there is a really sort of um, a, a behavior, I think you used the word explosives, if there is sort of like a, 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 an individual where it doesn't, the, the, a person really has a hard time and it really affects a lot of the people in the group and that person, the person that's having the hard time is removed from the group, can restorative practices be used for the people that are left in the group? Without the individual, yeah, or not. Funny, Brett, that happened just today, a few times. Because <laughs> I imagine it could be helpful, but I don't know if there are kind of, uh, you know, a lot of things kind of, you want everyone involved, but maybe if somebody can't be involved, does that mean it, it's no longer available as a resource to the rest of the group? No, we definitely, we definitely talk with kids afterwards if there's a significant event with another child of uh, processing that through a circle-like thing. I would imagine it could help the individual return to the group if mm -hmm. the group is able to have a 
better understanding of how mm -hmm. to think about what happened. We're stronger in some places than others, fair, um, but yes. And there's also a level of privacy, right? Of, yes. Uh, yeah. That you can uh, talk it's about a, it. It's a real sticky wicket, yeah, of, of just where you go. Um, because even if kids are really, really struggling, they're still our kids, right? And so we still have to figure out um, ways to support those kids. And we don't, we can't just kick them out. Like, that's just not no. an option, you know? So, and we also, you know, have classrooms of 16 other kids that also need to feel safe. And, and so it, it's really hard. And I, and I imagine in some circumstances, circumstances kids themselves can provide support that, a, yes. that an adult can't. Yeah, and that's often, especially with our little ones, that's often the conversation. Our friend is having a really hard time right now. What can we do? Yeah. You know, what can we do when that happens? Oh. Um, do you have a sense of how many, or like are all teachers now trained in restorative practices and, and to lead a circle? Or is Not there in the district? No, um, and I think we have pockets of really strong, like they're doing it as part of their culture. <coughs> I see the middle school specifically, like it is embedded in their culture, and it's just what they're doing on a regular basis, and it's just their response. It's like their first tier response whenever things happen. Um, whereas I think there are some teachers in the district um, who feel like I want to do it, but I'm not sure how it fits into my greater like practice. So I think we have a pretty wide spectrum of teachers at this point. So that's one of the things that I'm really curious to work with John Kitta about is really thinking about when we're thinking about district-wide implementation, like how do we support teachers and being more comfortable and bringing this into their classroom practice. So are you saying that all teachers at the middle school are trained to lead circles? Well, we have new teachers. We have some new teachers. So all teachers from last year. They have had experience with professional learning. I don't know exactly what you mean when you say trained. What you, what you could be thinking is different than what I could be thinking of, right? So we had professional learning for all our half days last year mm -hmm. around restorative practices virtually. You know, like not mm -hmm. the, no, probably not the strongest, but people have had access and, and information around this work. Um, but there, but I, I don't have like a measure as to like, right? Are you trained? Or is not? John Kidda doing the professional development? That is that who led the professional development? Some of it, yeah. John yeah. was involved with it. Lindsay Hellman at Up for Learning did a lot with the student leadership groups. And then when you talked a little bit about students being trained also in restorative practices and get to a point where they're comfortable leading a circle, yeah. and do you get a sense of where we're at with that in like? Have students already received that training, some students? or mm -hmm. it's, Yeah, it's definitely some students. I think, again, it's a pocket of students. Um, it's the students who have been working with Up for Learning. Um, and then it's sort of slowly, hopefully over time, getting to more and more students. And did that start last year? Mm -hmm. And so it's Up it for Learning? It started two years ago. OK. Um, not for with training through the whole, they weren't doing the training for staff. Yeah. Last year they started doing the training. So it was kind of like a year, a half a year really, with MSMS and MHS getting them ready, mm -hmm. a, a student leadership group in each of those areas. And they molded together sometimes, and they were apart sometimes. And then moving into um, last year, where they were doing virtual training with mm -hmm. the teachers. And then this year it's in person. Right, Jess? Yeah. yeah. And how many students are part of that? Group. Not. We had so many at the middle school apply last year, I, way more than we thought. I know the group that I met with who is going to be the leaders for the early release days, and that was sort of them pulling together people that they knew would be involved rather because they sort of need to get it ready to go because, you know, the first one is next Friday. Um, it was probably 10 to 12 students who are involved in that. Um, but again, those are the folks who have been involved. So that's before really rolling it out and getting people and drawing people in. So I don't think I answered your question, but yeah. And when you say, would that be the, so when you, on your slides, when you're talking about students giving presentations to the board, would the, it would be that group of students that's going through the training? Really for learning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And the, and the kids in, and some of the kids in this group last year, two eighth graders and four uh, high schoolers, I think they were 11th graders. They were part of a larger up for learning group or with this, with state leader, state student leaders mm -hmm. at a VSA conference, you know, where they were doing circles and modeling for over 150 superintendents, special education directors and curriculum directors, which was awesome. And they led cool. groups too. like our, our students were part of that as well. Great. Kind of thought about it more and maybe it's not a question. <laughs> well, the other question I did, I, I, I was thinking of right now, it sounds like an interview question, it's not, but can you think of a time that you ran into an RP skeptic and were able to like change their mind or at least kind of, you know, what, what, how do you approach a skeptic to this topic? How do you approach you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think mean, I think this is gonna maybe sound like soft, I guess. I think a lot of the anecdotal, just the stories of kids and, um, how I think with that restorative practice, or at least the restorative practice lens, um, that they wouldn't have been able to come to terms with one another, or they wouldn't have been able to feel a sense of community, right? So I can think of my own time as a teacher. I embedded circles as part of my own practice, and I was able, I actually talked about this during my interview with Libby, I don't know if she remembers, um, but I had a particular student um, who had a lot of marginalized identities um, and just had a really hard time being a part of any community and would regularly sit in the corner and be really quiet. Um, and then he slowly got to the point where he would blurt out some inappropriate things um, from time to time, not offensive, but you know, just like sharing his perspective of being frustrated with us. Um, and of course we worked through that, but what happened through having regular circles is that other students knew how to respond to him. So while he came across as really aggressive in those moments, other students knew like, oh, this is just like him being frustrated right now and, you know, we don't have to be worried and we can extend. So they actually started to extend support to him um, because they knew that was like his sign. Eventually it got to the point where he was able to use school appropriate language, which was also wonderful, but it was really heartening just to see that shift of how students understood because we were working and building community, um, understood how to respond to him compassionately and were able to support him in really tough moments. Um, so that's my skeptic response answer, so hopefully that helped. I think it goes back to what Jill was saying too. If you, put, you can't put all your eggs in this basket. Yeah. Right. And you have to think about a multi-leveled response and what Jess was saying earlier around some kids aren't ready, you know, they're, they don't want to talk to each other, they don't trust each other, or adults and kids, or adults and adults, you know, like it's just not a, you know, we had a situation last year where we had an adult to adult conflict and um, my suggestion was, I think we should probably do a restorative circle around this to get people talking and one said, nope, not gonna do it. And that's their choice, you know, that's, that's okay. At that moment that was, so we had to go a different route. Um, so it's you can, it's not something you force on people. However, it's something that I think teaching kids how to talk to each other and teaching adults how to talk to each other sometimes is probably one of the best things we can do for for kids and teaching compassion and empathy and how to how what does that sound like? I think that's imperative. And if I know this district, that is without naming it, maybe on a survey, that's probably something we value quite a bit here. Kind of follow up on that. I mean, when would you make a determination that a restorative practice effort isn't working? And if it's not working, what do you do? We've had that situation. Yeah. <laughs> you stop the circle. If it's not working, you yeah. stop it. Yeah. With the conversation of we're going to stop this because it's not productive and perhaps more hurtful at this moment. Um, yeah. So that's and, happened before. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just part of being a good facilitator and there's a lot of prep work, especially when you're thinking about these tier three conflict remediation. There's a lot of prep work that goes into this, right? You can't just dive into these really heavy conversations. You have to have like the tier one circles talking about your favorite dessert or your favorite vegetables and it has to be sort of part of what you do and then you have to practice it in low key. 
like lower risk situations and then before a conflict um, remediation circle you really have to talk to both parties understand their perspective understand how they're talking or coming to the table right it's not just something there's a lot of behind the scenes effort so by the time you get to a really high stakes conversation you can typically if you're the facilitator and if you're doing a good job you typically sort of are ready for that conversation and understand how humans are coming to that conversation. Yeah, shout out to Allie Coleman, who's our social worker at MSMS, who's a phenomenal facilitator of this work, and I yeah. impact conversations. I can't remember, you just used a really good term, Jess. Um, and she met with all part. you know, she meets with parties beforehand, she goes over what the questions are, what are you thinking you might answer that? Like, okay, so let's think about that answer. That was really help. that part of your answer was really helpful this part could be perceived as hurtful. Let's, you know, so she really walks people through um, prior to a high level conversation happening. Um, and Allie's amazing at this work. I was thinking yeah. about her as I was I bet, <laughs> yeah, she's really she, good. She I, just want, I just wanted to add a little, another sort of piece of context from my perspective to anybody who might be a skeptic. Not, not that you are, Seiji. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the way I think about it is like uh, any school system needs some kind of way of managing conflict and behavior and whatever. And when I was in school, I don't know if this is the same for anyone else of my generation, but the system that my school had was demerits. It was like... Did you go to Hogwarts? No, I went to a Catholic grade school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was something that the teachers were trained in. You know, it's not dissimilar in terms of how the school approached making sure that there was a school-wide system for managing these things. This, however, is, like, so much better for, all, for the reasons of not just you know, needing accountability and needing people to understand what, you know, what the you know, what the expectations are and live up to those expectations, but also, as Libby was saying, like, it gives us, it helps build tools around these things rather than getting the, you know, like, okay, demerit, and then after four of those, there's a note that comes home to your parents or whatever. This is just so much better for all those reasons, so. Yeah, because we need something anyway, so we might as well do something that... <laughs> helps foster good skills. Skill -based and I, 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 would, I would just add that it can be restored practice as a framework is, can be isolated from all the other things that we need. We need good curriculum that talks about the people. We need all the social emotional support. We need all the things. So it's a framework that encompasses a lot. It's also the way that we think about how we are responding to punitive punishment versus that and how it's like the, the wellness piece and the circle is like one stage, but how we really are responding to punitive measures versus, you know, restorative and, and how we move, you know, like I like transformative justice and how we like shift those thinking about all those other concepts, but I, you know, I really appreciate you, all the work that you're doing and all those connections. Yes, thank you, Jess. Oh, thank you. Um, so when you're talking about Ali and the higher level conversations, that's sort of what I was wondering about with my question about training. It's So how are there certain people on staff that are designated for once something rises to a certain level that not any teacher could say, OK, I'm going to have a circle around this you know, pretty intense behavior, but that it would go to like, a handful of yeah, them. and it's and it's different. You know, we've had situations where um, where the circle needed to happen, except there was definitive <coughs> gender. The you know students involved were really concerned that it was a male who was running the circle instead of a female, right? So having being having that relationship with kids is really good, so they can say that, right? Right. We had um, we've had situations where race became um, the challenge for the kids quite rightly. And so we found an outside person who could come facilitate the circle for us mm -hmm. um, where the students felt more comfortable. So, so that's more high school level, you know, because yeah. kids are a little bit more able to voice those concerns. They could do it in the middle school too. We just haven't had that experience in the middle school. Um, we've had concerns with 
staff around, I don't want an administrator running, or I don't want to, sorry, I don't want a teacher running that because they're at the same level in the hierarchy that we are, and it feels like that would be a weird position for them to be in, mm -hmm. right? So um, just being able to have those conversations are super important um, before this work when they're really high-impact conversations. But it goes back to the amount of thought that goes into it um, to make sure that it's it, that we start at a trusting level. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It would be nice in this sort of early-ish stage of, of progress at the district, um, like Jill mentioned earlier, sort of some data around it. So I don't know if you could just be forward thinking about reporting back out to us next year, you know, like how many circles happened? You know, how many, if you're calling them tier one, tier two, tier three, like how many of each of those circles happened? Or it might be too much data collection. Maybe tricky at like tier one, but. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and then like, did that, did that resolve the issue or did you have to resort to other methods? You know, it might be interesting to start tracking some of that data. Yeah, yeah, I can start thinking about that. I, I mean, if the culture is getting, I think, to where we hope, I would imagine that the tier one circles would be not worth counting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Like in it's a just way, what we do. that's what we do. Yeah. And I wonder if maybe the the climate survey could could speak to it, or I don't know what how, what metrics. So hard to get metrics. I was also thinking of Monday. We talked about the behavioral report that doesn't rise to an invest that, to an investigation. Or there was like there were like these were there were there were there you gave us two numbers. And it was a, you know, it's like 14, and then it was two that actually became an investigation. But that 14 was actually reduced from some other previous report. And I wonder about that number, and if that, the number that, I don't know where, like, there's a question goes to a principal, and the principal says, is this something I'm going to consider or not? And then if it's something they're going to consider, it might become an investigation, which is a much more, right? Isn't there, wasn't there three levels there and the numbers that you showed us were just the, the second and third levels? The number levels we totally showed you was, the, the larger number was the number of investigations. And oh, okay. the smaller number was the number of substantiated investigations. But then there was a behavior re report. Oh, there, yeah. Which <laughs> those would yeah. come up a lot. And yeah. that number would be really, that number would be an important metric, I think, for us. Mm -hmm. that, not right. that we need to see it in that context or whatever, but generally, the number yeah. of those going down or tra just having a sense of where they're at would be an indicator of culture that I think would be valuable. Or what the response to that one was. Was it a restorative justice yeah. circle that fixed the issue and, or not fixed, but you know. So how that, and that's probably in your data, right? Like what you yeah, did? Yeah, so we do have data around how people responded <clears throat> and then for each you know, HHB investigation, they're pretty clear. So that would be something that I could find. If it would be possible to see that as, as just somebody who would be filling out the form, to see that form, like we were trying to do last night. An, an empty one, you mean? Yeah, like a blank, like as the viewer, as the person filling it out, it'd be, even if it was just a PDF, you know, visual of what the form is, it just would be helpful. I was actually <laughs> driving home on Monday, and I was yeah. like, I think we tried to do that and didn't, so, yeah. Totally. Other questions for Jess? No, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, this is super much. helpful, and yeah, thanks for all your, your great work. It's um, very glad to have you. Yeah, really exciting. Have a happy birthday. <gasps> it's a birthday? Oh, wait. On Monday. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. she's going on a sailing trip, so I won't be able to see her. Oh, oh yes. great. Be fun. I'm oh, I'm remembering your three minute interview right now. Yes, me yeah. too. Yes, yeah. Uh, I didn't grow up sailing, but it's certainly become, I just apparently like being on boats. Yeah. <laughs> relaxing about like, being an anchor and not having to do anything. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Being stuck somewhere. <laughs> Dreamy. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. So policy monitoring, we have two uh, reports to approve, the Student Freedom of Expression uh, Policy F14, and then the 
HHB policy, which I'm not sure of the number, um, but the HHB policy that we had to review on Monday that we did not get to. Um, do I have a motion? Well, let's do it one at a time. Do I have a motion to approve the student freedom of expression policy? I'll move to approve the monitoring report for policy yeah. F14. Do I have a second to approve the monitoring report for F14? I'll second. Any discussion? I have a question uh, regarding the second interpretation. Um, there's two interpretations. Oh, there's one in bold. Are you looking at uh, what's written above interpretation? And I'm looking this, this oh, second those, interpretation uh -huh. and the evidence. Um, so I'm trying to understand this policy. This policy is saying any student that is that writes in the media and the yearbooks you know, has, needs to abide by this, right? Like, and, and so the second piece, you're sharing about the outside of a sponsored student media, these conversations push our faculty and students to sometimes uncomfortable places. I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly. And so if you can explain to me. <laughs> So well, I don't, this piece I don't have is the about. policy up, but under the interpretation, MRPS is the responsibility to engage students in thoughtful dialogue around potentially challenging topics in order to create well-rounded citizens. In such dialogue, students are able to express and challenge opinions. Faculties may limit speech based on the categories, categorizations found above interpretation. And it gets at your question earlier, Amanda, that um, when a teacher is making instructional decisions that make students uncomfortable for whatever reason, right? Um, maybe they're marching through a very white perspective of history. Maybe they used an example or a video that was triggering for a student. You know, like when our students are relatively good at bringing that up, <laughs> right? When <clears throat> what I was trying to get at here is, is that our students are rightfully bringing that up. Most are doing it in very respectful ways. And it's an uncomfortable conversation for our faculty that we're still, we're still struggling with how to, how, to, how to talk with the students in that. Like that's a, that's a learning edge for us right mm -hmm. there is what I was trying to get at. That we know it's a learning edge and we appreciate that learning edge. Um, that's what I was trying to get at. Okay, because I, what I'm unclear about is the policy itself, like why that, why that interpretation belongs to this oh, thank you. report. If this is freedom of expression, school-sponsored yeah. media. Yeah, I'm, I'm got it. Can you go so down? So if this second interpretation, if what you're sharing with us is about an instructional practice of a teacher, I'm not sure why it belongs in this okay. monitoring report. She's saying that the definitions don't include sort of like classroom dialogue. Yeah, we keep going in the policy down. <clears throat> Sorry. I think I just went a little bit further. Um, because student for students' freedom of expression, while this is a media policy, because I think it has to be, I, think, I believe this is a required, is this a required policy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, um, in my mind, student freedom of expression should go beyond student media, as at this point, we have very limited student media. <laughs> um, it's not, we had a new smart paper that was tried to get, out, get off and going last year that's had fits and starts throughout my tenure as superintendent. I think it's important that we, we talk about the fact that Student expression is really important to us at Montpelier Roxbury, and sometimes it's a really uncomfortable place for us too. Um, but you're you're right. If I look at this this policy, it's speaking directly to media. That's a very limited scope, I think. And so I would argue that this second inter it makes me uncomfortable to have that there because that is now part of the policy, and that is a conversation. Why did I get this it, 
we should have. It's not just media, right? Like it's a school sponsor events and things, but to have the conversation about uh, if a teacher is teaching something and a student is disagreeing because is Eurocentric and is not teaching the right history, this is not banning that student from so, having yeah, that conversation. That's right. so. You're talking about in the evidence as the second piece of evidence. Yeah, and I, right. I don't want this to be a precedent of a policy that doesn't exist yet. And I don't want it to be attached to a policy. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I think if, if there's not a policy to monitor on How can you report it? How can you approve it? Well, I think what she's saying, I mean, what I understand you saying and that I agree with is that you shouldn't use something outside of the policy as evidence of, of, um, of you know, complying with the policy. Yeah, but you know I, I think if, the, if you look at the way that it's written, I think the top part is compliance with the policy. The second part, which I think we should just strike, is compliant, like, yeah. I mean, she's, she's not interpreting the policy we have, and she's not interpreting compliance with that policy. So I, I think that's, I think, I think everything from what a modified it down is irrelevant to F14, and we should just strike it. Correct. We yeah. can strike that part. Um, yeah, and on that note, I actually would like to hear more about the evidence because, like, I when I read school newspaper, I was like, "Ooh, do we have a school newspaper?" <laughs> I was like so excited. I'm like, "Wait, I've been in the dark." So I would like to know more about, like, flesh it out a little bit, or have you flesh it out just slightly, and talk to like how are students getting involved in the newsletter? You know, is there like a we a section in this in the Solon salute? that is um, reserved for students? No. Um, so when we talk about a responsibility to create the environment that allows students the ability to express, I agree with that interpretation. And I think that we do that, but I just don't know exactly how, and I'm not seeing it in this, in the two sentences provided as So evidence. the school newspaper is a club, and it is required to have students Sign up. Join the club. <laughs> in order to make it published. And, yeah. and my understanding is students Nobody. have not signed up to be a part of that club this that I know of this year. Last year, there was a couple students in the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. The year before that, I've been interviewed around budget time. It's not a thriving club mm -hmm. this sure. year. I, another example of that, a lot of the kids, and I saw you noted this in your superintendent's report, a ton of the kids are actually running the social media for sports and stuff. Like they're actually empowered mm -hmm. to do that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and like so extracurriculars, when I saw extracurriculars, I was like, how do they, how are they? And I have seen, now that you mention that, I've seen some of those posts, but it would be nice to like just be more, um, provide more detail there. Of what? Of something that doesn't exist? That students, that students are in charge of the social media you know, posting about the sports teams, you know, so like, I don't know exactly, you know, just those, those are student created though. They're, it's not like school sponsored media. Right. So right. there's like a Solon's soccer team yeah. Instagram account. That's not school sponsored. They created it themselves. Okay. The soccer team created it themselves. It's not like something that's passed down from Matt Link to the next soccer group. I see. But, but I, so when, when I was advising RJA, the first year when Sarika was the community advisor, they had a Facebook page that Racial Justice Alliance created. They had a yep, they still have an Instagram page. They had an Instagram page, and then we, the year that I was co-advising, we couldn't find the password, <laughs> and like nobody knew the password of Facebook, so we couldn't post our things in there. But they were still RJA as a Montpelier High School, so even though they were student created. I, I wonder, yeah, like how we turned that piece to make sure like they could have written anything and like we had no password for it. Uh, none of the past advisors had it either. So I think we had to create a new page for the new group. 
Yeah, because um, I have one now. To be able to, but it's still do that. student run. But in a way, that is the school mm -hmm. creating an environment. You know, there are other schools that I know of that have shut down anything that says, you know, MRPS <laughs> or whatever, Montpelier, Solins. Like you're not allowed to use that in an Instagram. So I've had other in other schools that I know of, they've shut down Instagram accounts if they have that. So in a way, like I think you're fostering a culture by not by allowing it to thrive on its own. I don't know how that you like, shared some of the posts. Have I shared some of the posts? Like on our oh, and Instagram. It does, yeah. Right. So like you're sort of amplifying student mm -hmm. voice that way. So I just feel like it could be just um, added some more detail yeah, added. It looks when I'm, you know, the policy needs to be, I, this is a required one from the, yeah. but it needs to be updated. <laughs> yeah, they're looking that's at on us. VSB is looking at that one right now. No, it's on the VSBA if it's a yeah. mandatory one. But so, but I would say that if it's a, a school sponsored club, even though they're creating their own social media and running it, and tomorrow they decided to post horrible things in it. Wouldn't that be our responsibility? Because it is a club that is sanctioned and by the school. The school creates these clubs. It's a really it's, good question. It's yeah. this generation's newspaper. I know. Yeah. Well, even Instagram's a little faux pas, but. Right, <laughs> right. Um, that's a really good question, Amanda. I would imagine how we would address that is that we would go into restorative circles yeah. and restorative practices around that piece and could it do, explore the harm that could potentially have been done. Well, and it wouldn't be much different than a personal Facebook post attacking you, right? Like it would go into the HHB file, take a screenshot, like it'd be treated that way, right? Like, you're not going to shut down the whole page because of one. It could if it, were, if it were targeted at an individual, right. it could. But if we don't have the password, we won't be able to share that. <laughs> no, yeah, we'd I mean, have screenshots in that yeah. case. Yeah. I mean, I think well, no, I mean, I, 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 I agree it's a very good point because I can recall in, when I was in high school, the student newspaper could have printed something that would have been something that required the same kind of conversation between the school and the journalist and the editor and but the student newspaper was a club just like the girl soccer team is a club the girl soccer team didn't have their own newspaper when i was in high school but they have their own instagram page they did today. oh my god they I'm did so not old. they oh, did not I say, i'm older than you <laughs> it, it begs really interesting questions this whole social media thing and mm -hmm. that was not around when us <laughs> were kids exactly. and now we're dealing with as parents kind of <laughs> yeah. I mean, it begs a really good question. The way I read school sponsored media, it seems like it seems like the soccer or RJA website is school sponsored media. It's prayer written, published, or broadcast as part of a school sponsored program or activity by a student journalist. Mm -hmm. And it's a way that students are expressing generally themselves. or made available as part of a school sponsored program. I mean, I think the and the school is making room for that, and the school is amplifying that voice by putting it on our school-sponsored page. So I think it's, I mean, there's some really beautiful examples of, of student voice. In oh, did you look at those, the field hockey videos? Yeah, I loved it. And like, I think it was last year, the, did okay. the soccer team w decide, like, buy their own, like, black jerseys or something like that, and they all t took a knee, or there was something like that, like a concerted effort of the team they wore the same shirt. Yeah, isn't that the boys' soccer team? Boys the boys' soccer team. The, the yeah, boys soccer. Wore their Black Lives Matter shirts. Right. Yeah. And I mean, so there's an example of, you know, some schools might not have an environment where the team feels comfortable making that type of statement visibly and publicly at a game, in a game setting. And our school did. And I'm sort of proud of that, you know? <laughs> and so I just want to see more details. I guess I didn't think about that. Well, I know I didn't think about that piece for yeah, this policy the, monitoring report. The Race Against Racism also did a lot of advertising. They and, that, yeah. Yeah. and they yeah, have public speaker. Page. You know, they give a lot of really beautiful speeches at that event mm -hmm. that our, our students give those speeches, right? Or some of them do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I yeah. don't understand that a policy monitoring report would 
would would require that level of detail. And I thought we were just our role was that we were accepting that she's reporting compliance, not that it needs to be. I mean, I don't I don't see any evidence of, of non-compliance, um, but I mean, I definitely take your point, Emma. That I think this was written with a narrower definition of school-sponsored media than probably exists. The policy itself, yeah. Well, no, I think I think the inter the the monitoring report. I, I think if you read, the, I think the policy is written broadly enough, even though it was written in language that I think is from kind of like the school paper era. Like the language is broad enough to incorporate social media. Um, I just think it's an opportunity to. Con <laughs> I think the evidence portion is an opportunity to communicate out to our community and constituents about what we're doing well as it relates to this policy. And this, these two sentences just don't do it justice, just of the very limited knowledge that I have about what student voice is sort of what the culture is at, at our schools. Um, and there are other examples, like the other policy that we're monitoring, that we're looking at her monitoring report tonight, gives a very specific example. So there's been other times where you provide very like specific examples, and then this is a little more broad. And so I don't know if that, if, so I have a suggestion. I, I suggest we amend the motion to approve the monitoring report, the relevant portion at the top. I think there's compliance. I don't think we have to make maybe right. do more work, but yep. just duly note that for the next time this comes up mm -hmm. to Take give a, yep. a broader lens on what the evidence is yep. and what the definition is. Does that make sense? Can we approve an amended monitoring report? We'll just, this just pull the, I think we, we I think can. We do can do that? Huh? I'm, I'm just asking if we are able to do that. I don't see why not, because we're not, I mean, both like report compliance. I mean, I think we can approve the compliance. I would like to amend the, yeah, that's what Jim was saying. Yeah. He's, a, he's saying the same thing you okay. are. Okay, to yeah. remove the second piece. Yeah. yeah. And then. That's what he's proposing. I'm yeah. just asking if yeah. we're allowed to do that. And you think that's fine? I think that's fine. I mean, because we're not, because we don't have an issue with not compliance. Okay, so I made the motion, so I will accept that friendly amendment okay. to approve the, mon <coughs> the first half of the monitoring report for policy F14. Yeah, I, I would have meant to say to, to approve compliance of the monitoring report um, with notes for the record that Everything in the second part. Is second interpretation to that and compliance. second compli second evidence are struck. Yeah. Okay. Um, do I have a second? Second on the amendment. Any any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Great. The, Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Um, That's good. HHB. Do uh, a. Motion to approve the HHB uh, monitoring report. Here's that one. Hazing harassment and bullying or receive the hazing harassment and bullying monitoring report. Uh, do I have a second? A second. Any discussion? Um, I'll just, I just appreciate uh, Libby you being willing to sort of go back and, and take a closer look at the policy and the various um, incidences that were reported and, and dig a little bit and then be willing to actually change your, your uh, reporting on that. So I really appreciate you taking a second look. Mm -hmm. We know differently, we do differently. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, acceptance of the monitoring report has passed. And next we have uh, executive session to approve goals. Oh, wait, uh, real quick update from the equity. Oh, committee. sorry, thank you. Thanks so just to give you all a heads up that on Friday, right, Seiji, Kristen, Amanda, mm -hmm. we'll send you all a more fully fleshed out, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, wait, that's my homework. 
um, a more fully fleshed out, fleshed out report from the climate survey. The one that we sent to you a couple of weeks ago was like the bones of it, and now this will have more meat on those bones. So we wanted to give you that heads up because we would like you all to make time in your calendars for early next week to read that and give us any further thoughts. We heard from a few of you on the skeleton. We'd like any further thoughts on this more extensive version of it. So please make that time. The committee meet will be meeting next Wednesday morning. So you will have from Friday, sometime on Friday, through like end of the day Tuesday to get back to us. Mark your calendars. I'm going to mark my calendar, which is hard copy. <laughs> I know, you're going to need a pencil out. Write that in pencil book. on there. But I want to um, know what the sort of end product is. Is it that you're providing a report on the, yeah. that will be public? Yeah. Okay. It, I mean, it's part of our contractual obligation is to hold the survey and then do some kind of, here's what we learned. I have a meeting with them tomorrow, with the union leadership tomorrow. Can I tell them when they can expect that? They asked me oh, at my yeah, last meeting. Oh, that's a fair question. By the end of the month, I would think, right? Okay. And is all the data made public or just the? Right now, our plan is to just do this report yeah. of what we've learned. OK. Right? I, I think for the teachers, they might want to see the clean. The spreadsheet? Yeah. Yeah. Like the, just the clean one. Yeah, I, I mean, I, this is we're the gonna first, touch it. This can know. be. This is our first time at this stage in the process. So this is. There's no precedent. Would there be well, any identifiable information no. there? No, it was stripped. Not in the spreadsheet. To be clear, almost what ninety nine percent of what you do is public information. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <Right. laughs> Except like those. I the qualitative answers? The, anti the identifying information. Right. It's not. Right. I mean, they can do a pretty much yeah, information. Yeah, so like the results, there's nothing that includes any, like, anything that there's can no really names, right? identify people. Correct. Right. So, yeah, we could definitely attach a link. The, I think the easiest thing to do would be that full spreadsheet yeah. that Sagey cleaned up. It's got everything in it except for qualitative data. I think I'm going to hire Sagey as a data. Very, it's very good. Panelists. Really slow and expensive. Well, <laughs> <laughs> You'll work well with Mike Berry. <laughs> um, yeah. Can I ask a question about bullying? About? Or is that not allowed? Um, a proposal, maybe for the next agenda? Sure, you can have a proposal for the next agenda. Okay. I have a proposal sure. around bullying harassment next steps for us oh. as the board. Yeah, now that we've. That I dreamed about, so. If we can add that. There's a board discussion? Yes. Yes, thank you. I had a board dream this week, too. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> I was the restorative <laughs> skateboarder. <laughs> After of course course you like, oh, he does kind of look like Tony Hawk a little bit. <laughs> you and you're still being recorded. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 but we're soon going to enter executive session. Bro, we're not whispering. Um, <laughs> Nathan should know. <laughs> He's got some skateboarding skills in there somewhere. So, so now I think we're. Right. Yeah, I, mean, right, I, I right, move right. to. I move that we move into executive session for the purposes of personnel discussion. Okay. I was in favor. Oh, so I need a second. I second. I was in favor. Aye. 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 Great.